Hello, good morning again. Welcome back to the um, next scientific session of the uh, Congress. Uh, that will be scientific session six. Before uh, starting the session, as usual, uh, let me just remind you that uh, we have a poster platform available. Um, so please, you can um, go ahead through the posters and even engage in the discussion with the um, authors uh, to the uh, of the posters um, using the, um, the poster platform uh, that will be open until Thursday, anytime. So the uh, next session will be actually uh, divided in two parts uh, because of technical uh, reasons. So the first part will include two talks, which will be the two um, Young Investigators Awards. Um, and then we'll make a very brief um, um, cut about a couple of minutes uh, f just for technical adjustment and then we'll uh, follow with the um, flash talks um, till the end of the session. So um, having said that, um, let me just um, introduce you to our first speaker, uh, which will be um, Ignacio Iangala from the um, uh, Hospital de la Santa Creu y Santa Pau in Barcelona. Uh, he's being um, awarded uh, with the Young Clinical Investigator Award, so congrats to Ignacio. Um, his talk is titled um, Cortical Microstructure and Microstructural Architecture in FTLD, Looking Beyond Atrophy. So Ignacio, please go ahead. And... Uh have the opportunity to present my results uh, here today. So I'm a behavioral neurologist and my previous research focused on using biomarkers to characterize frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Today I will summarize some of my previously published works, but I will also present some unpublished data that follow up my previous research. During my PhD, I gained much experience in conventional structural MRI or magnetical resonance imaging analysis. And I explored the clinical value of a novel neuroimaging biomarker that is called cortical mean diffusivity to improve the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. But why do we need biomarkers? Well, biomarkers may be useful to increase the certainty of a, of a clinical diagnosis by detecting several changes like atrophy or hypometabolism. But these changes relate to the topography of disease and not to the etiology. That's why structural MRI is considered a topographic biomarker. Biomarkers may also be useful to track disease progression and these biomarkers are called staging biomarkers. In contrast, some biomarkers provide valuable information regarding the etiology, the cause of the of, the, of a given syndrome. Like for example, Alzheimer's disease biomarkers that uh, were presented by Alberto Yeo yesterday. By the end of this talk, I hope to persuade you that my latest research challenged the traditional dichotomy between topographic and etiologic biomarkers that you can see um, in this slide. Within neuroimage biomarkers, I will discuss diff diffusion-based imaging. These measures have a tremendous potential to unveil the earliest cerebral changes that occur in neurodegenerative dementias. First, some general principles for those in the audience who may not be familiar with magnetic resonance imaging studies. Diffusion weighted sequences capture the movement of water molecules in our brain, and we can model this movement into a tensor that represents the three main directions of water, of water uh, movement like you can see in the, in the slide. If the water has a huge displacement in all directions, like it occurs, for example, in the lateral ventricle, where we have a cerebral spinal fluid without any kind of restriction, then we can represent this movement as a, as a huge or big sphere like this. But if the water, um, but well, so diffusion tensor imaging is based on these principles and may provide relevant biological information of a given tissue. Um, for example, uh, water molecules will move in the direction of axons in the white matter as represented in the slide. 
However, the movement of water molecules in gray matter will be restricted by cell membranes and, and, and other barriers. And this will be represented by smaller sphere, as we can see in, the, in this figure. So neuro neurodegenerative diseases disrupt gray matter microstructure by damaging neuronal and glial cells membranes and increasing the interstitial fluid. At the bottom right, you see the representation of microstructural changes in the neurodegen neurodegenerating cortex. These microstructural changes can be, can be related to different phenomena, such, for example, neuroglial uh, damage. But how do we measure cortical mean diffusivity? Well, we first determine cortical thickness with a software called FreeSurfer. In short, we pre-process the MRIs automatically um, to determine the PL surface, which is represented here in the slide in red. And the surface also separating gray matter and white matter represented by this line in yellow. By calculating the distance between the red line and the yellow line, we can compute the cortical thickness as, as represented in the slide. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, next, we pre-process diffusion weight images to obtain the mean diffusivity map, and then we co-registered the, the DTI, the diffusion map, to the, to the central ribbon of the cortex, which is represented by this yellow line here. So we can study the microstructure only at the cortex, at this yellow line. And this is what we see here in the slide. Then, uh, finally, for both metrics, we normalize our data to standard space and we smooth it using a Gaussian kernel of 15 millimeters before statistical analysis. This elegant method for the study of cortical mean diffusivity was developed by Victor Montal, uh, a highly talented neuroscientist that is working in the neuroimaging core of our lab. Uh, all this experience with cortical mean diffusivity comes from a, from a very fruitful research line led by Dr. Fortea, which I have the chance of having as direct, director of my PhD together with Alberto Yeo. In previous papers, the team of, led by Dr. Fortea investigated cortical changes that occur in patients with AD from the preclinical phase to the dementia phase and showed that cortical mean diffusivity reflect a two-phase phenomena in Alzheimer's disease. But what about frontotemporal uh, lower degeneration or FTLD? When I joined the unit five years ago, I started phenotyping these patients and thinking about ideas for my PhD. I remember that one day I saw one of our engineers um, showing results on cortical mean diffusivity in patients with Alzheimer's disease. I was impressed by the extent of cortical changes that we could observe in these patients. So I wondered that maybe cortical MD or mean diffusivity could be a good technique to unveil cortical changes in frontotemporal dementia. And this is how I started working on the, the works that I'll, I'll, be show, I'll be show. So I, I started the most common clinical presentation of frontotemporal lower degeneration, and this is the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. This is a fascinating syndrome where patients uh, show a progressive change in their personality with a relative preservation of cognitive function. But uh, BVFTD, or the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, is a very heterogeneous clinical syndrome. And in accordance with this clinical heterogeneity, the pattern of cortical atrophy is also very heterogeneous. Indeed, up to a third of patients uh, do not show the typical pattern of atrophy at baseline MRI. So this group of patients always caught my attention, and I wonder if we could be able to capture the earliest cortical changes in regions where we don't when we are not able to show or to find atrophy. To investigate the clinical value of cortical mean diffusivity in BVFTD, we gathered a large multi-sample sample of patients uh, with this syndrome in a paper that appeared in the cover of the journal uh, Brain. First, we compared cortical thickness on the left and cortical mean diffusivity on the right between BVFTD patients and healthy controls and observed cortical thinning, which is represented in blue, in frontotemporal regions, which was an expected result. But we saw more widespread cortical mean diffusivity changes as shown in the panel on the right. These findings suggest higher sensitivity of cortical mean diffusivity to capture neurodegenerative changes. To investigate this, we computed the net effect size obtained by subtracting the effect size of cortical mean diffusivity and the effect size of cortical thickness. We found moderate to hide effect sizes favoring cortical mean diffusivity 
over cortical thickness in frontotemporal regions. Here we see the representation of the net effect size, net coins D effect size. Next, we explore the group of BBFTD participants where atrophy was not evident on the visual inspection of MRI di diagnosis. This group of patients is of a special interest since we usually, clinicians, struggle to differentiate between them and primary psychiatric diagnosis. Interestingly, we found that cortical mean diffusivity was also increased in the absence of significant cortical thinning. So we see green, which represents increased uh, mean diffusivity, but we don't see a lot of blue in, uh, in the maps of cortical thickness, so we don't have uh, cortical thinning. We also found that measures of disease severity showed a better correlation with cortical mean diffusivity, as shown in this figure. Regions in green represent regions where we observe a statistically significant correlation between the modified version of the CDR sum of boxes, which, which is the measure of disease severity in front of temporal dementia, and mean diffusivity. So again, correlation with mean diffusivity, but not correlation with cortical thickness on the left. In a follow-up paper, I also investigated these metrics in the ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis frontotemporal dementia continuum. We know that ALS and FTD are the two ends or represent the two ends of a clinical genetic and neuropathological continuum. Not a long time ago, ALS patients were considered or ALS was considered a pure motor disorder. However, now we know that up to 40% of the ALS participants have cognitive and behavioral changes. The neural correlates of these non-motor changes is not clear. In this paper we published, or that we published in the journal Neurology, we prospectively recruited patients uh, within the ALS FTD continuum. On the left, you see patients with without cognitive or behavioral impairment, in the middle patients with cognitive or behavioral impairment, and on the right, on the right patients with uh, full-blown frontotemporal dementia. Patients were assessed with the Spanish version of the ECAS, which is a cognitive test that means, ECAS means Edinburgh Cognitive and Behavioral ALS Screen that was generally provided by colleagues from the Carlos III Hospital in Madrid. We observe a continuum of atrophy as shown here in the figure, but most importantly, we observe more widespread changes of cortical mean diffusivity. And again, cortical mean diffusivity showed a better correlation than cortical thickness with measures of cognitive impairment as measured by the ECAS test. Recently, I have, I have received my first health project grant to pursue this research line. Next, I decided to work with patients with primary progressive aphasia. These patients present with speech and language difficulties that dominate the clinical picture at the first diagnosis. Each of the, of the three main PPA or primary progressive aphasia variants is characterized by the focal pattern of neurodegeneration that is represented in the slide. We have the logopenic variant, the semantic variant, and the non-fluent variant. And in color, you see the areas that are usually um, the focal areas that undergo neurodegeneration in these syndromes. We just submitted another paper exploring cortical mean diffusivity in primary progressive aphasia, and this paper is now under review in the journal Neurology. But today, I wanted to share with you some of my preliminary data on a novel imaging biomarker. To introduce this new bio biomarker, I would like to think about, I would, I would like you to think about an iceberg. Until now, we've been working at the, we've been looking only at the little mountain of ice and we've been ignoring what we have beneath or beneath the surface, the white matter, subcortical white matter. But we know that some neurodegenerative dementias affect not only the cortex, but also subcortical white matter. However, we don't have imaging biomarkers relating what we have above the surface to what we have below the surface. The relationship between these two components can be understood as a qualitative measure of neurodegeneration that may provide important information regarding the architecture of neurodegeneration. That's how I came up with the idea of the microstructural architecture ratio represented here. So we can sample or look at the mean diffusivity at the central ribbon, like this is cortical mean diffusivity, but we, combine the, we can combine this metric with mean diffusivity at the interface between gray matter and white matter, which is represented by this blue or purple line. 
if we combine these two metrics for each vertex, we can compute this, uh, this ratio. To explore if this novel imaging biomarker could differentiate between different neurodegenerative diseases, I gathered a sample of autopsy proven cases during my postdoctoral fellowship at the um, Memory and Aging Center in the University of California, San Francisco. As you can see, autopsy proven cases with primary progressive aphasia where Alzheimer's disease was confirmed. So here we have the, these maps represent the changes that we observe in seven patients that uh, presented with primary progressive aphasia, but where, where we have an, a definitive diagnosis and on, on autopsy. So these are autopsy proven cases. We see the expected changes for cortical thickness, widespread changes for cortical mean diffusivity, nothing new until here. But when we you look at the ratio combining gray matter and white matter, we see widespread changes that point to a higher impairment or microstructure uh, impairment in the gray matter than in the white matter. And so in this comparison with controls, we see in red the regions where we have more um, impairment in gray matter than in white matter. In contrast, when we look at, um, in a different patient that is also autopsy proven and presented with the same clinical syndrome, but in this case, this patient have a TDP uh, subtype type A, we see that we also have atrophy, we have uh, mean diffusivity changes, but we don't see this uh, predominance of, of gray matter impairment over um, white matter. Even more interesting, interesting is when we look at patients uh, presenting with primary progressive aphasia, but th that have a corticobasal disease on autopsy, for example. This is a, a 4R uh, tauopathy, uh, where we find also uh, atrophy and mean diffusivity changes. But uh, very interestingly, when we look at, at, the, at this ratio, we see the inverse, the, the opposite pattern that we observe in Alzheimer's disease. So we have, um, in this case, we ha patients have more microstructure this uh, impairment in the white matter than in the gray matter. These preliminary results show for the first time that we can detect a new degenerative signature that may be specific of the underlying etiology with a simple MRI. We think that these results may have important implications for the field. Imagine that in the near future, we will be able to combine plasma biomarkers with this kind of MRI uh, studies to provide important or very relevant information regarding the etiology and also uh, being able to stage participants. And of course, these kind of studies have a much lower cost than uh, positron emission tomography studies, which can cost each of, of each study can cost more than um, almost $2,000. Finally, I would like to thank all the members of the memory unit headed by Alberto Yeo and our collaborators at the hospital clinic and the Memory and Aging Center at the University of California, San Francisco. Special thanks to Victor Montal, whom I will always, I wish I'll, with, uh, with whom uh, I will be sharing this prize since he teach me almost everything I know about neuroimaging and his previous work and uh, collaboration and support made everything I presented today possible. I would also like to thank the Global Brain Health Institute, the Carlos III Health Institute and the Alzheimer's Association for believing in your young researchers like me and funding my current health research projects. This award means a lot for a young researcher like me and I hope it will help to move uh, to move forward and, and my career and achieve the challenging goal of, of um, conducting first level clinical research in, in our country. So thank you, thank you very much. Also, congratulations for the um, award. I would like to ask you to stay online and um, we will have some time for questions after the next talk. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next speaker will be um, uh, Germán Beleguer from the University of Valencia. He's the Young Investigator Award of this year. And uh, his talk uh, will deal with um, adult neural stem cells are alerted by systemic inflammation through TNF-alpha 
receptor signaling. Uh, Germán, please go ahead. Uh, I need someone to stop sharing the previous talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, here you go. So, um, hello, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, I would like to, to uh, first of all, to thank you, the Fibernet uh, Committee for this award, which is an, uh, an honor to me. And also to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share uh, the project I did during my PhD uh, in Valencia uh, that was uh, finally published in uh, Celestem Cell uh, last year. Oh. I would like to start uh, my talk by uh, highlighting um, how uh, lucky we are, not only uh, as a human being, but also as, as a, a scientist, that in the vast majority of adult tissues uh, now, uh, uh, we know that there exists a population of what we call adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells that uh, are able to uh, generate new specialized cells of the tissue while maintaining their identity to, uh, uh, to be able to generate new cells in the future. So these cells are responsible of the cell turnover and their um, uh, physiological conditions and also to fulfill the cell demand for tissue repair. And these functions uh, require a fine-tuned uh, balance between cell renewal, proliferation and differentiation that is uh, greatly uh, regulated by, uh, by uh, what we call the stem cell meters and all the signals uh, the surrounding uh, provides. Therefore, these cells are not only the natural source of regeneration, but also a great opportunity uh, for us to understand how to produce new cells. Uh, and it becomes evident that uh, the more we uh, know about these stem cells, the more doors we will open for future uh, uh, therapeutic uh, opportunities. So <clears throat> with this philosophy in the lab of Professor Isabel Fariñas, we are interested in understanding uh, the function and regulation of uh, adult neural stem cells that are uh, localized in the supermendibal zone, which are responsible to generate new immature neuroblasts uh, and migrate to the rostral uh, migratory stream to the olfactory bulb, where they integrate as a new as as new uh, new. But before you can uh, understand and study uh, how these stem cells function and, and are regulated, you need to be able to identify them. So <clears throat> when I joined the lab uh, already 10 years ago, uh, all that was known is that there exist uh, GFAP astrocytic cells that uh, presented uh, slow uh, cycling uh, abilities that were able to generate fast proliferating progenitors that divide for several rounds and generate new neuroblasts. But these pictures soon changed. I mean, to, uh, 2014, uh, <clears throat> another group described that these uh, cell stem, uh, these stem cells uh, can co coexist in different states. And you can find cells with a more activated phenotype and can, are able to proliferate while other stem cells remain quiescent and do not proliferate. In 2016, uh, different groups were already able to isolate and characterize different uh, cell groups uh, uh, that uh, display uh, similar features of activation and quiescent by applying uh, 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 fax uh, techniques and combining these with uh, different reported mice and combination of cell surface markers. Furthermore, uh, the single cell era started and this uh, brought more, uh, even uh, greater heterogeneity and different groups identify at the molecular level uh, cells that display different degrees of quiescence. And you can find cells that uh, looks more dormant while other cells are uh, like in an intermediate state between biasing and activation uh, and uh, uh, showing a more shallow uh, quiescent state uh, or a primate for activation state. So, uh, 
it became clear at that moment that we needed uh, new tools to be able to, to, to identify properly ourselves, to be able to, to, to study them. So for that, we, uh, we sat down and decided to design a new protocol, also based in fast technology, uh, following three criteria. First, that it could be used in any genetic uh, background, so, uh, avoiding the use of reported mice, that it allowed uh, uh, the, the identification of the cell population that was uh, resolved by single cell approaches, and also that it could be combined with classic purchase paradigms uh, to conciliate with uh, uh, classic experiments. And uh, with this, uh, we designed a strategy. This is the, uh, the uh, overview of our strategy that uh, basically is, uh, is based in, in, in a first discretion of non-neurogenic uh, related cells to later stratify our neurogenic lineage by the expression in one side of uh, the origin uh, as, as an associated market and in the other side, uh, CD24, at the, as the uh, progression of the uh, neurogenic lineage. And in the middle, the use of EGFR as a uh, marker of activation and uh, CD9 levels to distinguish between non-neurogenic -ne uh, and neural stem cells. So with this strategy, we've been able to identify up to eight uh, different populations, the astrocytes to different population of quiescence, the active neural stem cells, to population of neural progenitors and to population of uh, neuroblasts. And uh, due to the length of the talk, I'm not, I cannot go into detail uh, into this, and, and, and you will need to believe me, but uh, we were very happy to see that our, our isolated uh, populations uh, show the great coherence with, uh, was expected for them in terms of the transcriptome to, the simi to a similar extent uh, of the single cell uh, approaches uh, they are with the in vivo dynamics, both during regeneration of the superbendimal cell or during uh, and, uh, their uh, cycling state in homeostasis condition, and also their ability to generate uh, neurospace in vitro, which is a gold standard in the neural stem cell field. Uh, of notice, I would like to say that uh, with this protocol, uh, for the first time, we can uh, isolate cells in shallow quiescence that uh, are not cycling in vivo, resemble the ones that were described as single cells, and show an intermediate state between uh, activation and uh, dormancy. Furthermore, applying this, now we know that these cells are able to generate uh, neurospheres uh, when placed in vitro, despite they do not proliferate in vivo, and that these cells coexist in our cultures for, uh, to, uh, for the long term of the culture, and uh, showing a slow cycling uh, kinetics and a transcriptome very, very similar to the one uh, from, from the, uh, the primate cells that we uh, obtained from the superbendimal cell. Uh, opening the, 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 the the opportunity to, to understand and study this new uh, spiral state. So now this uh, uh, has been recently published in a state-by-state -state product in the protocols that uh, now uh, anyone can use. And uh, I, I, I couldn't go into detail, but I would be more than happy to, to, to discuss this later with anyone that is interested in using it or wants to apply a protocol like this in, uh, in the system. And, and now, of course, if you uh, can know how to identify yourselves, you, you, you can go back and, and, and see uh, and try to understand how they function, how they are regulated. So we uh, were uh, interested in, in how the regulation from quiescent and activation and the other way around is regulated. And one uh, of the things that uh, we realized is that quiescent, uh, uh, quiescent uh, fractions are uh, enriched in gene signatures related to inflammatory response, not only in vivo, but also in vivo. It is well known that the uh, neural stem cells uh, are regulated by many uh, signals that come from the surrounding area. But not only this, also from signals that come from long distances uh, through the blood vessels, and also from neurons or the choroid plexus of the cerebral, uh, spinal fluid. 
Additionally, there is increasing evidence that the stem cells in the system are uh, sensing the injuries in other parts of the body, uh, as it has been described for, uh, for the muscle and the hematopoietic system. For example, if you injure one muscle in one side, in the other side, the uh, resident stem cells respond to this injury and are primed for activation. So <clears throat> we thought that this is a nice scenario to test whether uh, quiescent neural stem cells are regulated, could be regulated by, by uh, uh, long distance signals. And especially because it's known that, uh, uh, and, and we thought that, uh, that uh, systemic inflammation could be a good model to test uh, because it is well described that it activates microglia and also can cause a secondary uh, neuroinflammation in the, uh, in, in the region. So to test this possibility, we uh, combine uh, our uh, protocol with uh, uh, mice that were injected and in the, uh, with LPS to, to, to induce uh, systemic inflammation. And to test whether this could be activated in our cells, we injected uh, EDU one hour before uh, sacrificing the mice at different time points. And what we could observe is that there is a transient activation of neural stem cells that enter uh, to cell cycle uh, after LPS injection, but this activation is um, then uh, it's uh, reduced uh, at the later stages. Interestingly, this transient activation even uh, turned into more, uh, a high production of new neurogenic cells. In fact, it's the opposite. What you see is a less production of the latest stages of the ne neurogenic progression, less progenitor and less neuroblasts, while you increase the number of quiescent stem cells a population that do not proliferate at all, not even after uh, inflammation starts. So we wonder whether this transient activation could be coupled to a mechanism of going back to the quiet. So to test this possibility, uh, we apply different uh, regimens of uh, EDU uh, incorporation to mark proliferating cells. And here you can see that if you uh, inject EDU and sacrifice the mice after one hour, what you label is the proliferating states. You can see uh, uh, active uh, uh, neural stem cells, progenitors, and uh, neuroblasts to incorporate the EDU. Um, if you increase the number of doses of, this, of EDU, uh, and inject them uh, up to seven times during 12 hours, what you can see is that a higher proportion of cells incorporate the cells, meaning that other cells enter proliferation as well. But the quiescent infraction is still uh, do not incorporate uh, EDU, meaning that they are very reluctant uh, to uh, proliferate, even they are not a slow cycling uh, uh, proliferating cells. But interestingly, if we uh, wait 12 hours after the last injection of EDU, what we can observe is that, is that uh, many cells that proliferate now are arriving to the later stages of the neurogenic lineage, which makes sense, you are producing new neuroblasts, but also we can observe that cells that proliferated now are going back to a primate state. So with this, we observed for the first time that uh, it looks like that neural stem cells under an anesthetic uh, condition cycle between a primate and, and, uh, and an active uh, state. So what about systemic inflammation? So if you induce systemic inflammation by LPS and, and, and uh, apply the same uh, paradigm, what you can see is that you have activated your cells, you have more cells that have proliferated in the, uh, the first 12 hours, but now many of these cells are uh, going back not only to a primitive state, but also to a deep quiescent state, something that never happened in the species. So this could be uh, demonstrated uh, that, that, that uh, cells after activation can go to a deep quiescent and, put, uh, and, and explains why we share more quiescent stem cells uh, when inducing systemic inflammation. And <clears throat> What's the mechanism of this? 
So if we look into the tank, into the inflammatory response characteristic of the quiescent stem cells, what we see is that uh, the top upregulated term uh, in this transition is TNF alpha mediated signal pathway. And interestingly, the cytokine is highly upregulated 24 hours after LPS uh, injection in the superendimal cell. Who is TNF alpha? TNF alpha is a very well known cytokine that has been studied in many, many uh, systems, also in neural stem cells with very contradictory uh, results that uh, it binds to two different uh, receptors and, uh, and, 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 uh, and has many, many, uh, many uh, different uh, functions. So we tested the possibility that uh, this signal and so these two receptors could be mediating this mechanism. And indeed, uh, and indeed, uh, using different in vitro models that I'm not showing uh, today, but also genetic, uh, uh, genetic knockouts for the both receptors, we could demonstrate that TNFR1 is required to mediate the rector to deep quiescence. If you don't have TNFR1, you can see that cells got activated, but they do not go back to, the, to a deep quiescence state. Why? Um, TNFR2 is completely required to start the mechanism. In fact, if you don't start this mechanism, you don't see cells arriving, uh, going back to quiet. And with this, I, I, I would like to finish my talk with uh, what could be the potential um, uh, relevance in, uh, for, for therapy of this uh, mechanism. And uh, now uh, we uh, demonstrate that if you treat uh, mice that are recovering from uh, chemotherapeutic treatment and they try to regenerate. If you treat during this regeneration process of mice with uh, a combination of anti-inflammatory um, drugs, what you see is that these mice do not recover as well as their control group. Interestingly, during this regeneration, there is a peak of upregulation of, of, of TNF alpha that is blocked by uh, the uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Additionally, if you, if we apply the same regeneration paradigm to uh, TNFR2 knockout mice, what we can observe is that these mice are completely fine to restore neuroblast production. It's not a problem to, re to regenerate their the, uh, production. But what you see is that this mice has lost uh, stemness. If you test these cells, in vitro for neurocell formation and for multipotency, what you see is that these cells expand uh, uh, worse than, and, and differentiate uh, less than the, the uh, quantum control, meaning that uh, this mechanism helps to protect uh, the stainless during regenerative uh, processes. With this, I would like to, to, to conclude with the, with the highlights of, of, of the paper. That is that uh, now with this protocol, uh, shallow quiescence can be prospectively analyzed in vivo in the superdimensional zone, but neurocell culture retain a population of a low cycling primate like neural stem cells, that systemic inflammation reaches the brain and continues alpha perception neural stem cell stemness, and that TNFR1 and TNFR2 coordinate for more than a reversible activation of primary neural stem cells. With this, I would like to thank especially Isabel Farinas for the opportunity she gave me and for being my scientific mom. Jose Manuel Morante Redona for being my uh, scientific dad. And also uh, all, of my, uh, all, all of my landmates, especially Ana Domingo and Terry Duarte, who helped me, uh, helped me a lot with the project and for many other reasons. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Herman. Um, for a very nice talk and also um, congratulations for the um, for the award. So we have a couple of minutes for um, um, uh, some quick questions. Um, again, if you, anybody has um, interest in making a question, please do so in writing using the platform, and I will be able to uh, transfer the um, uh, the questions to the speakers. And uh, also, if anybody in the room wants to make um, a question, uh, we have a microphone available, um, so we can uh, do these questions. Um, 
Um, I'm not getting any questions um, yet. Um, let's uh, wait for uh, uh, a little bit uh, to see if um, uh, there are any questions coming in. <clears throat> All right, no questions, no question from the room either. So, um, yes, there is one question from Manuel Guzman. Yeah, yeah this is for Herman. Awesome work, congratulations. Have you only tried LPS as a model for systemic inflammation damage, or do you believe that with other stimuli or the peripheral stimuli, you could also have similar effects? I would expect that it, is, it, it, it has been uh, described that uh, many situations of our um, normal life can uh, increase um, or, and produce a uh, low uh, inflammation. So uh, I would expect that uh, uh, any injury that can be sensed by the surrounding area, the neural stem cells, can uh, modulate uh, and regulate uh, uh, these cells. What's the purpose? We don't know yet. But, uh, I would love to, 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 to test that. Thank you, Herman. Um, any other questions? Um, either from the uh, online audience or here? Okay, it seems that there are no more questions. Um, so as I say at the beginning of the session, uh, we need to um, uh, make a brief um, break now because we have some technical uh, adjustments to do. It won't be more than two or three minutes. So please stay online for the rest of the, of the session. And um, I would like to thank uh, again Ignacio and Germán for um, their very nice talks. And um, again, uh, congratulations to both of them for the Young Investigators Awards. Uh, so we'll be back in two, three minutes.